probably start uh, uh, getting going. Um, so welcome back, everybody. Uh, thank you for being on time. For those of you who are back, um, now I want to introduce um, uh, Chris uh, Adashi, from, who's the manager of sustainability and climate change at Tech. Uh, so over to you, Chris. Thank you, and um, thanks everybody for for, for participating today. And um, see a number of familiar names and, and faces on the call. So. Um, I may have to reference some of you or, or defer questions actually to you because I know some of you know the answers better than I do. But um, what I've put together today is a bit of an overview, pretty high level of, of our climate change strategy and a bit of where we're coming from in terms of setting our strategy. And then the second half of the slide deck, and it's a relatively short deck, it's about 12 slides, talks a bit more about our pathway to decarbonization. Um, I thought people may be interested in that. That said, when you see the sort of breadth of things we're thinking about, I'm happy um, to take questions or, or maybe move through the pathway on decarbonization a bit quicker because it is only one aspect of the broader climate change strategy. So um, we'll see how it goes, but um, just because I, I do a bit of a deeper dive on that piece doesn't mean we can't speak about some of the others. And I think what I'd like to start with is just a bit of context for people around, you know, various risks and opportunities we see in the climate change space. And when we, I say we, I mean tech, but I think this is true of, uh, of the industry as a whole. And, and by no means is this a comprehensive list of all the challenges, but I think it's three buckets that are, are really um, pressing and, and, and quite active right now. And the first one is just around rising expectations. And I think we heard that in the first presentation. I, I think people are quite familiar with this. Um, you know, whether it's, um, you know, climate strikes every other week last year or watching the movement that various companies are committing to, you know, it's clear that the expectations around climate action are increasing and, and companies are working to step up to that. You know, an interesting note I'll make about this slide, I put this slide together about a year and a half ago. And when I first did it, the Boulder Commitments had another mining company. And I said, you know, the first or second company to set a target about being net zero by 2050. And then I gave a presentation again, probably eight months ago. And all of a sudden it was, you know, here's the list of companies that have committed to net zero by, by 2050. And it was very mining focused. But then jump forward to today, and I thought I would add the Microsoft example. For those of you who aren't familiar with their target, they've targeted to be carbon negative by 2030. Um, so not just not just getting to zero, but you know, essentially offsetting or, or drawing carbon from the air. And, and you know, I'm not sure that that pace of change is going to continue, but you see um, this is something that I think we're seeing broad and that you know, this is now becoming table stakes for people. This is an expectation of our industry and of our companies. Um, the second piece I think is the increasing regulatory action um, and I think that comes in various forms. Uh, I think the one that gets spoken about most frequently is carbon costs. Uh, but I think the permitting process is one that, that, you know, is getting increasing attention is attention and we're seeing regulators use quite a bit more. And, you know, I could, I, I spent a lot of time on the policy side, so I don't want to, you know, go through the entire 20 minutes talking about that, but there are two key pieces I wanted to, to flag for people. One is that, you know, in a number of jurisdictions, there's actually more embedded carbon costs, I would say, than people realize. So if we look at British Columbia, where the majority of our operations are, we, we pay quite a bit of carbon taxes, but you have other regulations, uh, like there's one that's basically a clean fuel standard. And so to meet that, or for our suppliers to meet that, we bear those costs as well. And, and I could probably spend a lot more time talking about the complexities of how to price carbon uh, based off the policies that each jurisdiction encounters. But what I'm trying to flag for people, it's more complex and it's probably more costly than people realize. The other piece though, is that we are seeing, you know, a number of different actions taken by regulators to be more firm. So we've seen cases where there are emissions caps either on specific mines or on sectors. And we've seen cases where, uh, you know, the one there is, is from a case in Australia where we've seen rejections of applications based on climate grounds. Now, to be clear, some of these are still the exception, they're not the rule. And, and I don't know if they'll, how much they'll expand or if they will, um, but these are some of the things we're seeing happening more frequently, which suggests that you may see this occur uh, more frequently in the future as well. 
the last piece, and I'll just flag here quickly, is is the investor pressure piece. And um, you know, my my tenure at tech has been about a decade, and it's always been in the climate change space, and it's been largely with the operations and largely with policymakers. But in the last year and a half, I would say the movement from investors has been significant. I spend probably a quarter of my time now engaging with with investors and lenders, and so. I think the comment earlier was fair that we are seeing a lot of action. I think the thing that's challenging to, to decipher still is what kind of impacts are those going to actually have on the industry? Because investors, lenders are quite diverse. They're not a homogenous group. They have different approaches to how they make their investment decisions. Um, so I agree they, they are increasingly factoring this in. They're doing it in a number of different ways, however. and. Um, you know, I think we'll, we'll see it continue to increase, but I think it's a little early to say what kind of impact we'll actually feel from it. One other piece tied to some of those risks and opportunities I flagged um, relates to some disclosure work we've done that has some underlying analysis. So um, hopefully most of you heard of the task force on climate related financial disclosures uh, referred to as TCFD. Uh, if you haven't, I suggest Googling it. I'm not going to go through all the background of it here, but one of the expectations there is the, that companies, well, I guess there's two expectations really. One is that companies are disclosing within their major disclosures the impacts that climate change will have on their business. And the second expectation is underpinning those disclosures that you have undertaken some scenario analysis. And so what you see on the screen are some of the scenarios that we disclosed about a year ago where we looked at those transition risks and the physical risks of climate change across our business units, across those scenarios, and assess, you know, what happens in these different cases for those business units. So, you know, as an example, in a, in a three and a half degree scenario, maybe your transition risks are low, but as was pointed out earlier, your physical risks will become increasingly significant and they're going to likely require capital investments that you wouldn't have to make if you were going down, say, a two degree scenario. With that quick background, um, a bit where we come from, what we, where we settled on for the last few years is this four pillar approach to our climate change strategy. So the four pillars are about positioning us for a low carbon economy, reducing our carbon footprint, support for appropriate carbon pricing policies, and adapting to the physical impacts. The first pillar there is really about what is our portfolio composition in terms of what commodities we produce, but also what is the nature of our, our assets? Are, do they have a low carbon intensity? Do they have a low carbon footprint? Um, will they be resilient with increasing carbon prices globally? Will they position us better relative to our peers as investors make those decisions? And where you see that materializing is the move uh, you know, for us to shift our portfolio really through a copper growth strategy with copper being one of the metals with the greatest upside for a low carbon economy. Um, what you see in the bottom right there is a graphic from our part from Barclays, and it's just really mapping out emissions intensities for various companies, and they normalize it to a copper equivalent basis, given the, the variability of the portfolios there. And, and this is something where we feel we're positioned well, and we try to demonstrate that to our investors. But I think the other reality is, and, and kind of ties to the second pillar here, is that the whole industry is going to start to decarbonize and the advantage we may have today is not necessarily one we'll have going forward. And one example of that is if you look at our graph there, our scope two emissions are quite low because the majority of our operations are in British Columbia where we have access to hydro. And so when we look at the, the marginal abatement cost curve, you know, sometimes if you had diesel or you had um, other uh, fossil fuel based source of electricity where you can get something cheaper. Now, let's say with a renewable source, we don't really have those opportunities to the same degree. Um, so, you know, we're, we're starting, I think, from a slightly more challenging point on the cost curve. And, and we'll, I think you'll see a number of these companies move quite quickly to get closer to where we're at. Um, I'm going to talk a bit more about our goal on the next slide, but we have set a goal uh, recently announced this year in 2020 about targeting carbon neutrality by 2050. And there's some sub goals tied to that. Uh, we are very engaged in, in carbon pricing policies, and we think they're, they're good tools really to help the world get those price signals in place that we need to facilitate that decarbonization and, and shift where we're making investments. Um, you know, this, from a strategic standpoint, 
you know, if you just marry the idea of carbon pricing globally and you look at that graph to the right again, you can see where it becomes strategic for us as well. You know, if you had a global price, which I don't think is going to happen anytime soon, but you can imagine if a lot of your key competitors all have the same levelized carbon price, this becomes a competitive advantage for you very quickly. Um, so this is something we work quite a bit on with our regulators and with other policymakers to think about um, the way carbon pricing can impact competitiveness and how it can help people transition to having lower carbon operations. And, and the last pillar there is really about adapting to physical impacts. And, you know, I think this is one that people, when they think about climate, at least in the context of mining, it is often focused on the transition risk. Uh, I think, Sean, hopefully you're still on the call as well from Golder. And I know we've been working with Sean through the Mining Association to set more guidelines in place around um, how to incorporate resilience and risk management on the adaptation front within operations. What I'd say is I think there's a lot more action happening in this space, especially in our sector, than people often realize. Um, you know, through ICMM, we've been working on this for a number of years. Um, we still work actively with some third parties to work through climate risk and climate resilience. Um, Sean's doing a lot of great work through a partnership with the Mining Association. But I, I also put in the, the discussion board earlier, um, I flagged that there's also the Government of Canada's Adaptation Working Group. And for people who want to look more into some of the work and research that's going on around physical risks and physical impacts, I'd encourage you to go there because you will find a number of different studies. I think I counted about a dozen in the mining working group, but you'll see it for other sectors as well. Um, a number of different analyses that are trying to evaluate the risks of a change in climate. And then in some cases, we'll actually have decision matrices to help you figure out, okay, you know, should we make this investment decision or should we make this one? And at what time should we do that? So I'm going to go a bit more narrow and I, I'm looking at the time and I guess I'll, I'll move still at the same pace I'm going through here. But as mentioned earlier in the year, we released our carbon neutral goal by 2050. But I think to the conversation earlier, you know, it's important that we start taking that action now. Um, you know, we can't postpone climate action forever. And so we thought it was important to set some interim goals. And these are some of the ones we landed on. So the first one is about reducing the carbon intensity of our operations by 33% by 2030. Um, and, and that for us is really, you need to have a line in the sand to get you from 2020 to 2050. Um, what we tried to do with the other two goals though was to be a bit more tactical. And in the coming slides, I'll explain why we picked these two. But in the next five years, we think it's important to really start to shift uh, our procurement of electricity in Chile towards green sources. And as context, for those of you who, who don't know Tech's portfolio all that well, you know, the main source when we think of scope to emissions for us, which are emissions from electricity are really in Chile. So that's why it's focused there. There's not, you know, any other, really other reason. We're pretty well positioned in our other jurisdictions. And so we're making a move there to get to at least 50% by 2025 and 100% by 2030, but we're optimistic we'll be able to achieve that much sooner than those target dates. And the third goal there is really about moving towards zero emissions alternatives and to provide that incentive in the organization or that goal that says, you know, we can't sit and wait for the entire industry necessarily to try and solve this. We need to put some skin in the game and make sure that we're adopting, that we're testing some of these vehicles. And, you know, I know Peter's on the call and obviously never be no Peter. Uh, I think, you know, Peter's really instrumental, if not the lead in the organization for driving this. And we think this is absolutely one of the ways we need to go to decarbonize. And so this picture, I think, uh, on the screen, hopefully gives more context to why we actually picked those two areas for the shorter term goals. And what you see on the left hand there under emission sources are the four main buckets that I think most of you are probably familiar with. These are definitely our, our areas of emissions for tech, being power supply, mobile equipment, um, stationary combustion and, and process emissions and then fugitive methane, uh, which is really tied to our coal business unit. And so one of the exercises we, we undertook in setting our goals and that we continue to evolve going forward was to look at those buckets of emissions and ask ourselves a couple of questions. One was, which of these are commercially competitive now? Like where are we gonna get the best bang for our buck to take our action? 
But the other question was also, which of these is the most material and which one should we target? Even if we can't get a solution today, getting a solution towards it would, would have a material impact on what our emissions are going forward. And so we asked those two questions. That were, that's where we landed on the power supply piece and the mobile equipment. So that's why you see those shorter term goals set. But of course, we're working on an entire roadmap internally between Peter and myself, a number of people in tech to map out the, the breadth of technologies that could help us solve these issues. Um, but also keeping an eye out on some of the longer term solutions, whether that's methane recovery and abatement or electrification of low carbon fuels. Part of our approach will be to make sure we've got that pipeline that we're identifying those technologies and that we understand where do we need to take action or where can we leverage the efforts of groups like ICMM, COSI or, or this group here. Um, I, I think I'll maybe just skip through this slide. I think it really just captures what I just said and, and all it was meant to reflect that, you know, right now we're cautious not to put too many eggs into one basket and to make sure that you look at the breadth of, of technologies available. And I think that actually resonates a bit with the conversation we had in the previous presentation, uh, or at least some of the comments about, you know, each mine is unique. Each mine has a unique profile, has a unique uh, or distinct energy supply. Um, and it has a distinct mine life and, and capital investment schedule. So, you know, the idea here is to make sure that we, we try and do fit for purpose here to understand, you know, if you've got a mine today that's got a mine life of another five or 10 years, you know, you're not really going to get to a battery electric vehicle lightly, at least for a surface mine. Um, but, you know, maybe that B20 diesel fuel is something that's easy for you to integrate. Um, so, yeah, I think that's all I'll touch on on this slide. I've stolen this from Peter, so hopefully he doesn't uh, call me out for, for butchering it as I talk through it here. But I think one of the, the things we've been working through too is to do that due diligence and not just to understand what technology may be appropriate per location, but also which technology or which piece of equipment is appropriate within the mine site itself. Uh, and, you know, Peter is really leading this work and ensuring that we do this analysis and we understand the duty cycles, we understand the route profiles, we understand the fleet status, you know, when is the equipment going to be retired um, and, and what's the technology readiness level. And one of the things I think tech's been successful at, and it ties not just because of decarbonization, but our entire move in technology has been to try and move quickly to pilot some of these technologies. I'm not going to say we're necessarily the first to pilot some of these, but Something that I think we've done effectively in the last couple of years, largely because our, our leadership, all the way up to the CEO has driven this, has been to be a bit more open to taking risk on technology and, and getting them in the field quickly to test them out in safe applications uh, where you're not necessarily putting productivity at risk, but you can get that familiarity and that experience and begin to build that culture. Um, you know, one of the examples we have behind that is really this electric bus pilot we undertook in the Elk Valley. And for those of you who aren't familiar, the Elk Valley is in the eastern part of British Columbia, which is Canada's westernmost province. And I think for those of you who are familiar with, with uh, I assume everyone here is familiar with, with mining operations, you know, an electric bus is not going to get us to carbon neutral alone. It's not really going to get us all that close. But that's actually not the critical part about a story like this. What's important for us is, A, to start getting familiar with battery electric vehicles, to get familiar with the charging stations, to get familiar with the maintenance requirements, but just as importantly, to ensure that our employees are familiar with it. So, you know, this, the bus on the screen is one that is taking people from the local towns to the mine site every day. And if you want someone to transition from a diesel haul truck or, you know, whatever other piece of fossil fuel based equipment to move to something battery electric, you know, it helps them to get that experience at least firsthand here to understand the noise difference or the ergonomic differences. Um, so really for us, it's about building that awareness and that education and connecting people with the technology. Uh, and, and building just that capacity in the company so that we, we have that expertise and, and it will help us as we move to different classes of vehicles. Um, you know, don't take this roadmap as the definitive roadmap, of course, for when we will see these technologies mature. But as I was saying earlier, when, when we think about the transition to decarbonization, we're trying to do this in a very methodical, sequenced manner. 
and to do so in a manner that also recognizes that you know we're not you can't double your workforce to try and go and test you know 50 different pieces of equipment at once and, and I mean, let's be fair, they're not all gonna be available at once, but to make sure that we've got a line of sight to when we think different classes of vehicles um, will be commercially available to start understanding when we've got capital turnover in the organization and to really roadmap this of when we can start to move from a pilot to broader use to basically our, our de facto solution going forward. Um, now, on this slide, of course, I'm just showing electrification. It's not to say that electrification is the only way we, we're going to address our emissions from mobile equipment, um, but I think it's indicative more of the thought processes we're going through to, to understand these uh, evolutions of technology and to sequence and time them. One other piece I thought I'd touch on, I stole this from an, another presentation I'd given, is simply um, and, and we're experiencing this in our thought process right now, which is, especially if you go down an electrification roadmap, you know, there are some significant implications of what that means for your power loads. Um, one of, um, I think one of the things we're realizing is, especially because the majority of our minds are grid connected, I think we have a history of, okay, we need some power. We'll just call up the local utility, you know, we'll work through that, we'll get the power and there we go. But I think when we start thinking about the load you'd be putting on, if you look to electrify your, your fleets or, or whatever other processes you can electrify, all of a sudden you start looking at the local generation and the transmission capacities and you realize that, you know, these may not be sufficient and they may be costly. So, you know, one of the things we're trying to think through right now is, well, how do you actually get that transmission, that infrastructure in place, that generation there so that you can have a competitive cost of power and a sufficient uh, amount of power available for you as you make that transition? And I think one of the key messages is it's important for, for companies like Tech and others to start to have those conversations now because there's some lead time we're going to need, even if we don't think the haul trucks are going to be available to go fully battery electric for let's say five to 10 years, the amount of time you need to work through the finances and work with governments and utilities to get that infrastructure in place and to figure out how you're going to de-risk that. Um, because of course the government and the utilities probably don't want to fund it all themselves. Um, so I think that's just one of the things I'd flag too. When we think about the technology, thinking about all that power supply, or it doesn't have to be electricity. I mean, you could be thinking about hydrogen. The same would be true as the hydrogen supply there. There are these lead times that I think we all need to be aware of and focused on and, and pushing for, but also recognizing, I'd say, the opportunity to work with a lot of governments who are going in that direction. I think I'm going quite a bit over time now, uh, which is perfect. So I think that's my last slide. So hopefully that was somewhat informative of where our strategies come from. I know I've jumped all over the place. So uh, I'm happy to speak to any of the slides specifically, or if you want to talk about some of the issues around physical impacts or portfolios, I'm happy to speak to those as well. Excellent, Chris. Thank you very much. That was a fantastic presentation. Um, Heather, do we have any questions? Or yeah, we have one of Thomas, I think. Yeah, um, I have a question, and I, it was triggered by the quite hetero, heterogeneous um, carbon footprint or carbon intensity in the copper, um, across copper players that you showed. And I, um, you know, being one of the more well, you know, more low intensity producers of copper, what, what's your view on the trends and the progress in terms of um, being able to sell your product on that, uh, uh, with that as a value add and, you know, certification schemes or embedded carbon um, protocols uh, through the copper mark or other efforts? What, what's your view on, on the trends that you, as you see it? Yeah, and just Thomas, just to make sure I, I'm clear on one thing, I think, I don't think that's the actual graphic I have when I did that slide. 
Um, but the, the slide I had shown, um, oh. anyway, I, I thought the one I had earlier was on a ton of copper equivalent basis. So to be clear, it was the variable portfolios all normalized to a copper equivalent. So that wasn't sure. just production. Um, so I think the trend is there. I think we're seeing the movement. So you've got things like copper mark, you've got Irma. Um, there's probably a, too lengthy of a list to go through, but I think you're seeing this come through in the, the customer poll side. Um, so I think that's something we, we've always been supportive of. Um, and I think we'd like to see emerge more for two reasons. One is, you know, I think it's ideal if we're all gonna take action to reduce our emissions, that people are able to factor that into their, their decisions when they make their, their purchases. Um, but the second reason, of course, is for us, we think that can be a competitive advantage for us. And, and it's not necessarily going to materialize, I don't think, in terms of a, a uh, increased price for the products we sell, but it may be greater market share, or greater access to markets. Um, what, I, what I'm challenged with, though, is there's a lot of discussion, there's a lot of thought, and we, we see groups like Apple or BMW um, taking more action on this. I think we're, we're still at a point in time though where it hasn't flowed all the way through the supply chain to really feel that yet. Um, indications are there, um, but I don't think it's actually really fully impacted the, the market. That said, um, I, I wouldn't take that comment as an indication saying I don't think it will happen. Um, I think there's a lot of uncertainty. So I think one of the things that companies like us, and I know a number of our peers in ICM are thinking about is how do you monitor these? How do you track them? How do you engage in them? Um, but that, that definitely seems to be the direction it's going and I'm just not sure it's fully there yet. I have another question uh, from Zoli. What would you do differently today for a Greenfields operation to enable a cost-effective transition to electrification? Um, so, uh, two thoughts. One is I'm trying, I'm going to try not to cop out of the question, but I think one of the things is, well, it really depends on where you are and you need to have, like, you need to know the context for it. But the other thing I would say, and it's probably not necessarily the answer you're looking for here, but one of the things we've been working on quite a bit in tech is how to work with our project development teams and to use our stage gate criteria to um, support and enable our projects teams to look at the alternatives early. Um, I think what we've seen is, historically is, you know, you develop a project to a certain point, and then maybe you start asking some questions around sustainability when you get to too late in the project development process, and you've already sort of narrowed down your options. So one of the things is to really get our project teams thinking about those options far earlier in the project development process. The other key piece for me, I think, is um, I think you want or I think you, companies will benefit from having the internal resources who can support those evaluations and who have some of the expertise um, to, to understand which technologies are, technologies are available. Like all the stuff we're talking about, the detailed evaluations, you know, you need that skill set, but you also need that awareness of, of what's going on internationally. Um, and for us, you know, I, I, there's, there's a reason I've said Peter Wan's name 20 times during this presentation. I think that's Peter for us, right? You know, you need those resources that can connect with the teams. And I guess the last piece I'd say is more, uh, you know, strong leadership, right? A lot of the, the commitments and a lot of the actions we've taken, I mean, we just, we updated our, our power contract agreement in Chile for our QB2 operation. And you don't really get that type of action unless your senior leadership is there and they're at the table negotiating that. Um, so sorry, it's not necessarily a look at these technologies. It's more process oriented. Uh, but yeah, that's what I'd offer up. Chris, can I jump in for a second there? I, I think that where Zolly's going, and, and I totally get it, is that, you know, what are the types of technologies that you would look to exploit given a, given a greenfield sheet now? 
And, and if you think about things like the Crush It Challenge in Canada, where it's looking at efficient comminution, one of the big drawbacks that they're facing at the moment with, say, the CAM, you know, the conjugated anvil hammer mill, for example, is everyone has sags that run for 50, 60 years. So, you know, you've got to, and this is what I was talking to earlier in Thomas's uh, presentation was, you've got to look at how you can adapt that. Well, that adaptation piece comes out of the equation. And so um, you think about that, you think about um, rail veyers or IPCC, with a clean sheet and not, um, you know, ramps that have already been designed at, at 10%, it, it just, it changes the game and it changes the, the, the capital and it, and it changes the, the total cost of ownership of, of so many of those technologies. So you would, you would definitely look at them through a very different lens. Yeah, thanks, Peter. And I think you touched on one other thing I'll flag. And Peter and I have this conversation uh, all the time, which is, in that decision-making process to, um, and I guess this is true of brownfield or greenfield, but maybe you can be more successful in greenfield, is, is how, um, how you frame those decisions in the sense that, is it purely an NPV decision or do you have that opportunity to look at that total cost of ownership and um, try to influence or adjust the way you make project decisions. I know we we always try to find that balance between what's the most cost effective upfront versus, you know, what an operator would really like to have and, and what a project team designs and when an operator operates, um, you know, they don't always see eye to eye on that, but you have that opportunity early on to potentially change that um, view. And as Peter said, you've got that flexibility then to look at those other technologies. We have... Craig wanting to wondering how to ask a question. So Craig, I'm thinking you might have one. Yes, I do. Sorry, I'll turn my video on as well. Um, a great presentation, Chris. Thanks for that. Just one question. I love your um, your, your your strategy and and especially like the chili moving to 100% uh, renewables. Um, how are you handling firming of the renewables in Chile? Um, and um, I'll be interested to see, because I suspect there's, there's something going on here, um, not, not from you guys, but across the whole board, where the 100% um, the, the renewables or the abatement is an accounting principle, but we're still putting out as much carbon. You know, the, the bit that you save, someone else picks up, and so the net total is, is the same. Yeah, so um, I couldn't go, I, I couldn't, uh, not, not out of confidentiality or anything, just I, I don't have the knowledge of how they've actually constructed that contract one of the things though that we're very cognizant of the exact point you just made um which is you don't want a case like you said where it just becomes an accounting or a shell game where everybody says they've reached 100 percent renewables and yet you've still got half the grid or more supplying through coal um you know right now uh, as we transition, the other half of the contract is still coal-based, but I think as we move to the um, to the hundred percent, I think we're going to have to. Well, I don't think we're going to have to evaluate to ways where we may want to build that in to have you know the certificates that say you know we procured that specifically, so we avoid the double counting. Is that does that address, or were you thinking more actually physically how they were firming? Uh, no, it, it does. I, I, um, I think it's it's a worldwide problem that we've got, um, and and you know the, the the prime example for me is the Vatican, who did a hundred percent offset in I think it was um, twenty thirteen through forests to be planted in Poland or you know or Romania somewhere, um, yeah. and as we speak, not a single tree's been planted yet, but they've been hundred percent offset for six years. You know so. Um, it is a challenge to actually make it work. What what we've been looking at is actually just load shaping. See how much of your base load can be shifted to renewables, um, yeah. and uh, you know to, to fundamentally reduce that overnight base load um, that can only be supplied at the moment by uh, by fossil fuels. Yeah, and yeah, I think the whole load management piece and, and <laughs> you know again, Peter and I have this conversation all the time, and I think. Mm -hmm. It leads the, the point about uh, energy intelligence as well, right? And, and there's, uh, I don't want to overemphasize this, but there's so many things we can do around energy management and a number of our operations still. I think 
I don't know if others have had this experience, but every time you do, you bring up energy audits, it's sort of like, oh, well, I mean, we're already at maximum efficiency. What else are we going to find? And yet that's sort of been the narrative for quite a while. And yet power, like we, we find ways to be more uh, efficient. Uh, it's not endless, but I think there are those opportunities still as well. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. I think, and sorry to keep on going, but I do think really the solution to this rests with us in industry um, rather than on the energy side. Um, and, and the control has to rest with us in industry because we're the people that use the, uh, we use the energy. Uh, and so we need to make sure that the energy that we use is in the manner that, that we can actually create it rather than forcing them to actually conform to how we uh, have, have used it for the last hundred years based on, you know, millions of years of, of fossil lay down. Yeah. Uh, Craig, sorry, you, you did prompt one other thing that, that I'll just share that I think is interesting to think about as well is going back to that investor piece. Um, I, I agree that, you know, we have to take that leadership. I think that there are strong opportunities, not, not that we don't partner with our power suppliers already, but I think our power suppliers, especially in jurisdictions where maybe that power is privatized or where they are producing largely with fossil fuels, they're hearing it from their investors as well. And they're concerned about some of those risks. It doesn't mean, I'm not saying that you won't still see coal generation in a number of locations globally, but I think you will see some of the ones who have large portfolios of coal getting pressure from their investors as well. Um, and that can change the dynamics as well. You know, if they suddenly have restrictions on their access to capital, what's their incentive uh, financially to go towards, they have that financial incentive then to go towards renewables and that can impact, you know, the dynamics of our negotiations with them. So just one other thought, I think those pressures will hopefully um, support maintaining cost competition for, for renewables. Yeah, hopefully. Oh, they, I mean, the example that we've got in South Australia is um, the world leading renewables, but also the world's highest power price. Um, yeah. you know, so it's, uh, oh yeah sweet and, and I, <laughs> by no means am i saying uh in all <laughs> in all cases i'm i'm aware that i'm not suggesting that you know uh renewables win every time but i think that there are, we will see some of those cases emerge or that may be the financial leverage we have with the suppliers if, mm-hmm. if we're not the only ones pressuring them i think the renewables have to win so we have to find a way that it can actually work. That it, it's not, um, you know, the argument that that fossil fuel is cheaper um, isn't going to last for very long. Um, eventually, we've got to we've got to find a way to make the other one work. Now I'll stop and let someone else get on. Sorry.